Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone attending today's webinar, The Future of Energy Transition in the Arab World. My name is Noor Ghadanfar, and I am the Director of Campus Engagement at the MIT Arab Alumni Association. I'm also the Senior Manager of Partnerships at Greentown Labs, the largest climate tech incubator in North America. So the MIT Arab Alumni Association really aims to be a bridge between MIT and the Arab world, sharing knowledge, facilitating connections, and increasing opportunities between the two entities. So one of the things we truly enjoy doing is putting on webinars that cover a number of topics and bringing incredible speakers like our wonderful speakers today. The topic today, focused on energy transition, will navigate the complexities of the transition process in a heavily dominated and dependent oil and gas region, economically, politically, and culturally. We also hope to illuminate the needs, gaps, and effects of such a transition at various scales, focusing institutionally, nationally, and internationally. So without further ado, I would love to introduce each of our speakers. First, Shada El Sharif is an advocate for climate action, green economic transition, and sustainable development in Jordan and the MENA region. She has spoken and written on these issues through national and international media platforms. She is an advisor to Jordan's Ministry of Planning and to International Cooperation on Sectoral Reforms and Climate Change. She was a part of the World Bank team that developed Jordan's Green Recovery Plan through the NDC Partnership as well as the advisory team developing Jordan's first public expenditure and financial accountability assessment on climate. She served as director of the Jordan Environment Fund at the Ministry of Environment and as director of clean tech for the USAID funded Jordan Competitiveness Program. Shada founded Sustain Mina, an advisory and awareness raising platform. She holds a master in public affairs from the Harvard Kennedy School as well as a Bachelor's of Science and Master's in Engineering in Environmental Engineering from Cornell University. So thank you so much, Shada, for being with us. Our second speaker, Dr. Noura Mansouri, is a, is a research fellow at King Abdullah Petroleum Studies and Research Center, a research affiliate at MIT, and an expert at the World Energy Council. She is currently the co-chair of Task Force 2 on Climate Change, Sustainable Energy, and Environment under Think20 Italy 2021. She was also the lead co-chair of Task Force 2 on Climate Change and Environment under Think20 Saudi Arabia 2020. Previously, Dr. Mansouri has worked at Arriva, the global leader in nuclear energy and fuel cycle. She earned her, she earned her MBA and PhD degrees in sustainability and energy transitions from the University of London. She's the author of Greening the Black Gold, Saudi Arabia's Quest for Clean Energy. Dr. Mansouri completed a postdoctoral research fellowship at MIT and is a recipient of the Ibn Khaldun Fellowship from the Center for Clean Water and Clean Energy at MIT and the King Fahed University for Petroleum and Minerals. Finally, she is a board member at Women in Clean Energy under the Clean Energy Business Council for the Middle East and North Africa. So welcome Dr. Noura Mansouri. And then last, but certainly not least, Julie Newman joined the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in 2013 as the first director of sustainability for the Institute, where she was charged with launching the Office of Sustainability. She also holds a lecturer appointment with the Department of Urban Studies and Planning, with which she has co-launched two courses, one exploring the scales of sustainability and the other entitled Solving for Sustainability at MIT. Both courses seek to engage students in complex problem understanding and solution development while leveraging the campus as a test. Prior to MIT, she launched the Offices of Sustainability at Yale University in 2004 as the founding director and the University of New Hampshire in 1997 as a founding member of the team. She has been a pioneer in the field of sustainability and higher education and has published several articles, as well as been a founding member of several consortiums, both nationally and globally. So thank you so much, Julie, for being with us today. So let me just say, I love having an all woman panel. So thank you for each uh, to, to take the time to be here. And for our audience, I've asked each of our panelists to prepare approximately a five minute introduction or opening statement on the topic at hand before we really dive into discussion. 
So if you have any questions at any point during the discussions, please type them into the Q&A option at the bottom of the screen, and we will answer them as we move through the next 50 minutes. And with that, Julie, I would love if you could start us off. Great, thank you so much for the kind introduction. And I'm just so delighted and honored to be on this panel uh, with, with Noura and Shada. Uh, excuse my pronunciation. And I hope we can connect again. This is phenomenal. So let me just share my screen. Give me one moment. And I hope this is really just the beginning of a, of a discussion um, together. This is going to take so many different angles to, to solve for. And uh, I just wanna confirm that you can see this. Okay, great. Well, once again, thank you all of you in the audience for joining us today and a special thanks to Noir and the MIT Arab Alumni Association for hosting this event and for including me from headquarters here at MIT. Um, I'm going to provide a very brief overview and insight into our most recent uh, climate action plan entitled Fast Forward, MIT's Climate Action Plan for the Decade, to give you some insight in terms of how we're positioning MIT to respond to this climate crisis, if you will, and the role of the campus. Um, there's always more to share. So as Noir said, I'm going to give a very brief overview, but there's always, given our, you know, how interconnected and linked we all are, there's always space and room for follow-up, um, should we not get to it, you know, today. So for those of you not familiar with it yet, this is really groundbreaking. You should be proud of your institute. This is MIT's second climate action plan. Both plans were informed and established following a year long community input and debate process uh, and reflective of the most up-to-date climate science. So again, this demonstrates the ability of a large institute like this to really keep uh, a process moving and we're looking to, I think, update almost every five years to ensure that we're constantly aligned with the newest science, understanding of opportunities for alignment, which I'll get to at the end, and of course, you know, solutions. Um, our first community input process took place in 2014, and our second one took place starting in the fall of 2019, extending through early 2021. And as you can see here, you know, MIT has boldly committed to meeting the world's climate challenge by going as far as we can, as fast as we can, invest in, invent, and develop new suite of tools, which I'm sure many of you are involved in as we speak, including science and technology breakthroughs to new institutions and policies needed to deploy them rapidly, wisely, and equitably. And lastly, to educate and empower the next generation of students. And I think that's what is, uh, you, as we all know, one of the most unique positionings of higher education, as you can imagine. So with the commitment to go as far as we can, as fast as we can, MIT has now mobilized our community of experts to combat climate change in the world and on the campus. Uh, and the second point is that a governance structure has been set up uh, to ensure the successful impl implementation and community and wide engagement you know, of that plan. For today, I'm only going to focus with, within my five minutes on what's happening on the campus, but please know this is just a snapshot of how we're reacting at this scale, but MIT globally is responding uh, at, at is activated across the board, okay? So we now have an executive level steering committee providing oversight and accountability to the plan at large, and a climate nucleus whose responsibility will be to unify and coordinate across all of the activated areas. Much easier said than done, as you may know, working in your own institutions and to oversee a number of new working groups that align with the work stream to ensure accountability. Uh, so for the sake of today, um, I will familiarize you with how we have been tasked and prepared to organize the campus response because I believe that's what I'm meant to represent today. So there are 14 campus commitments that we are responsible for implementing between now and 2026. We've organized these 14 commitments into four categories in an effort to aggregate uh, you know, our efforts. So as you can see from this slide, just to bring you back here to the visual, is um, in terms of my, my responsibility, I'm in the midst of working with the nucleus to launch a new climate footprint working group. But in the meantime, we're targeting net zero 26, 2026 goal, which I'll share shortly, a net zero, a, a zero direct emissions goal by 2050. And I'll explain the difference in a moment. Preparing for a changing climate with the resiliency and adaptation in campus as a test bed. So those are the organizing factors within the plan. 
embedded in the plan are these 14, there are 14 commitments. I'm just sharing how I've now had to organize operationally, if that makes sense. So for those of you working with the organizations at a leadership role, I'm really just trying to pull the curtain back for you to say, how are we activating and preparing to implement all of these? It's one thing to be handed a plan. It's another thing to turn that plan into action and the whole and to get those plans implemented and, and funded and accountable and su succeed. So that's what I'm sharing, sharing with you at this level to think about this scale. So the sum of these parts organized around mitigation and resiliency, EV infrastructure, greenhouse gas portfolio expansion and leadership all enables the success of getting to 2026, eventually zero emission by 2050, preparing the campus for a changing climate. And of course, leveraging the campus as a test bed to ensure that, that we tie to the educational mission uh, of the Institute. So in short, we've activated each of these work streams to ensure that we have a full comprehensive understanding as to who and what will be needed and the resource available. 12 of the work streams are now activated, um, though only two have a 2022 deadline in an effort to ensure that we have a comprehensive understanding as to who, what, how much will be needed. I'm sure many of you on the call can relate to that from your own leadership roles. So moving forward, we have two, uh, you know, if you take away anything, we have, we have set two ambitious climate goals. So one is 2026. So remember five years ago, we set a 2030 goal. So we had a strong baseline of our scope one and two, basically uh, the, the energy we produce and the energy we purchase. And that's what's accounted for here. As you probably are all aware of alum, we, we have grown and we've anticipated that growth by also updating our, our, our current uh, central utility plant uh, to be much more efficient and actually produce all of our own energy oh, for the next at least 15 to 25 years. We have also invested deeply in, in energy efficiency, we'll get to it again shortly. So our 2021 baseline with all of this work is at, at this around 191,000, a little bit more metric tons. And our near-term goal is, is to figure out how to offset that by 2026. But that's notwithstanding a number of investments, which I'll share with you, that we anticipate needing to make in order to get down to zero direct emissions. So this is easier said than done and very relevant to the, to the task at hand today that we're discussing. So the takeaway here is that we also, you know, the task is to figure out how to reduce emissions in the world. So with that in mind, we've created a dual approach. We're figuring out how to continue to, to reduce emissions on campus, which, which we'll share, and also figure out how do we reduce emissions in the world. So that's, that's the unique part here. But in the meantime, for the first time, we're also going to be expanding our portfolio and start to account for uh, scope three emissions that we've been tracking for a number of years, but really had to get down to a science to figure out, can we track it in the same way year over year so it's consistent and that the data has integrity and can become accessible to the campus. So again, that's a, a universal that's a universal challenge for all of us at organizations. So one notable component here, though, is pre-COVID. This is about uh, you know this is capturing travel that was accounted for by our own dollars. By 2020, of course, air travel uh, you know was down more than 50 percent. And so the question we're asking is you know what is the new normal going to be? And so that's that's what we're looking to right now. Uh, but we're now accounting for that and we'll be creating a carbon offset project uh, uh, travel fund. So uh, in short, we have 14 commitments. I'm now overseeing 17 team leads. We have a faculty uh, net zero group with about 30 faculty supporting all of this work and really tying into their research and expertise. This doesn't mean these are 30 faculty that agree. That's the beauty of this. It's 30 faculty with very disparate perceptions that I'm now facilitating to figure out, can we find common ground in how to get to 2026 and how to inform a, 2020, a 2050 goal. And my most exciting part is having the student, uh, these students that are working with us. So we're can really tying it back to the educational mission of, of the Institute. That number should grow over time, mind you. So in my last couple, you know, two minutes or so, I just wanna share some, some pieces here. So there's several strategies that have been developed and acted upon over the past five years. Some of those you'll see in a moment and many more are being assessed, designed, implemented in real time. 
Um, and in short, our team is collectively managing this combination of on and offsite strategies. So I'm gonna share some of our onsite strategies. Um, and with some of these insights in the campus interventions, keep in mind, I'm managing the oversight. I'm not the technical person managing what I'm about to share with you, but rather I'm involved. So let me share a couple of these. Uh, in terms of how we're going to get to, to 2050, um, we're, and you can see here the way we're thinking at MIT, and this could look hopefully even better next year, is accounting for sustainable design in, in our new buildings and renovations and setting, continue to ratchet up and set a uh, minimum of gold certification in the US and on obviously uh, you know, aggressive energy efficiency within those. We have deep energy retrofits projects taking place. Many of you may have learned or be studying in these buildings, you know, ranging from Brain and Cog to, you know, to Coke uh, and others here. Um, we're looking at upgrading, as I mentioned, we've upgraded the central utility plant, looking for accounting for about 10% reduction there. And it's been designed to be a flexible energy system for incorporating future innovations. Um, we're in the midst, for those of you who are Sloan-based, we're in the midst of converting legacy system uh, legacy steam systems to medium temperature hot water distribution to enable in and bring in this new energy error at MIT within the system. So this is in real time. This is a picture just from this fall. Uh, and as I mentioned, offsite, we are looking at large scale aggregation as a vehicle to scale up market models through aggregated purchasing power. Happy to speak to that. This is one that we've done now and we're in the midst of launching a new version uh, to account for are you know to get to zero emissions we are looking at integrating this is actually grounded in research here at mit of ai enabled sensors employing artificial intelligence to reduce on-campus consumption accounting for what we're determining at the moment is three to five percent but again we hope to increase this in time there's a commitment with embedded in fast forward mit both on ai and on solar on roofs in terms of uh, more than doubling our solar across campus, which many of you may say, finally. So we've, uh, you know, we've been looking into this for many years and we're prepared to do this. And then the last one here is looking at electric vehicle infrastructure, which I'm, uh, I've got uh, uh, students. For those of you who remember the IAP term, we've got four students coming in uh, on as a team to basically work for four weeks during IAP on just this challenge. In essence, a large hack. So these are our commitments on this front. So to bring closure, um, for those of you interested, this is our list of, of active uh, energy reduction and greenhouse gas uh, emission reduction strategies. And the piece that I bring to the table is, is the scale of the campus and the context of the campus, the city, the state, the nation, and the globe. And for the first time, our, you know, our net zero planets are aligned, if you will. We have a real opportunity. I look forward to this discussion to figure out what actually has to take place at each scale? Do we have to get to net zero alone on the campus or how do we interact what's taking place from what I hear on the rest of the panel today? So I'm out of time, but thank you. Uh, it's a lot to cover, much appreciated. Awesome, thank you so much, Julie. I think that was really illuminating, especially when you said how, you know, all the faculty don't exactly agree that on, on the strategy to take that we need to get there, but they all agree we need to get there. And, and I think we see that even at, at Greentown Labs, um, I see that every day where we're, we don't know exactly how we're gonna get to net zero, how we're gonna help fight combat or combat yeah. climate change, but we know we need to get there. Um, and these disagreeing voices continue to grow as we get to even a national and regional scale. So with that, Dr. Yeah. Nura Mansouri, if you could share some of your introductory comments, I'd love to hear them. Thank you very much, uh, Noor, and thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here amongst this uh, esteemed panelists. So I'll, um, I'll try to be quick to fit the five minutes. There's a lot to cover, uh, but um, I plan to provide an overview on the Arab region and then touch upon the outcome from COP26 and end with the circular carbon economy as a way forward. So the Arab region, as you all know, is very diverse. This is the graph of the demographics, um, quite uh, um, high population density starting in Egypt, followed by Algeria, Iraq, Morocco, Sudan, Saudi Arabia, et cetera. And it comes with its own challenges, especially water challenges. The water poverty line defined by the UN is at 1,000 cubic meter per capita, 
and the absolute water scarcity line is at 500. And as you can see, most countries in the Arab world are below the absolute water scarcity line. So very water poor country, the average Arab world is just more than 200 uh, cubic meter um, per capita. So, um, so that's a great challenge. There are also energy challenges. Of course, we have the GCC countries that are energy exporters, but a lot of the countries are also importers. Um, here we see the energy uh, net energy balance. So we, we have um, some countries that are net energy importing like Jordan, Lebanon, Morocco, Tunisia and the West Bank. And then we have the small energy exporting countries, Bahrain, Egypt, Oman, Syria, and Yemen, and the large energy exporters, the GCC plus uh, Algeria, uh, and Iraq, and Libya. Um, and then, um, of course, we have uh, energy challenges from the energy consumption, because these are all developing countries, understandably. Uh, require uh, a lot of energy. The average uh, energy consumption per capita in the Arab world is way above the world average, uh, as I said, due to uh, you know population growth, uh, economic development, and this comes also with um, uh, emission challenges. Uh, emission per capita is also uh, more than double uh, in the Arab uh, region uh, compared to that of the world. Uh, and so the uh, obstacles really in the Arab region can be summarized in the following. There are water, uh, uh, water scarcity continuing to intensify with little action really in individual countries, a fast growing energy demand. There's a need for energy diversification, which is primarily based on fossil fuels. We have poverty issues, social justice issues, food security issues, and also regional integration or lack of thereof. Um, as well as climate change impacts, including the warming itself, sea level rises that really threatens human uh, coastal settlements, as well as change in precipitation, which impacts the limited infrastructure or humble infrastructure we have in most Arab countries, the risk of flooding, etc. And then the air quality, uh, of course, the CO2 have increased over the years, and this is corresponding to the growth that happened over the past decades. Arab cities are among the 20 most polluted cities in the world. Um, and then most importantly, of course, the Arab region is home to conflicts and political instability, uh, political crises and conflicts, including in Palestine, Egypt, Libya, Tunisia, Iraq, Sud Sudan, Syria, and Yemen, especially post the Arab Spring. Uh, and then we have the urban uh, rural divide challenge where uh, Near universal access to electricity in urban cities, but still some limited uh, access in rural cities. So um, in the future, there is even more demand uh, for energy projected in all Arab countries, as we can see here uh, by 2030. Uh, so more emissions and more space for economic development. I'll highlight just a couple of examples on the ambitious renewable energy targets. We have Morocco here with 100% target by 2050 for wind, water, and solar energy. We also have GCC countries that have started the energy transition towards renewables with installed capacities uh, that are growing. These are not the latest data, but uh, it shows you the diverse um, energy uh, mix in, in, in all the GCC countries and um, even plans within the economic within the economic plans to have um, even more ambitious targets with the UAE leading the way with net for net zero by 2050 and Saudi Arabia following um, net zero by 2060. So the, the, the targets are already there. Uh, these are some of the examples of uh, renewable energy projects across the Arab world. Th these are not uh, an exhaustive list uh, or not an exhaustive list of projects uh, and not the latest one, but we can see that uh, many of the countries have already uh, adopted uh, a number of renewable energy projects and more uh, coming on the way. Um, in terms of COP26, the pressure is on, you know, the, in the covered decisions we saw for the first time, the mention of fossil fuels. So recognizing that climate change will be much lower at 1.5 with an operative uh, uh, direction to reduce uh, global warming, reducing CO2 by 45% by 2030 and net zero by 2050. Uh, phasing down uh, instead of out, which, which was changed by India and China in the last uh, minute. So phasing down unabated coal and inefficient fossil fuel subsidies while providing support for developing countries. 
and maintaining equity, common but differentiated responsibility, and international cooperation for the developing countries, so including all the Arab countries. Um, there were, uh, you know, outcomes for carbon markets, including non-CO2 metrics, having a free market, uh, transparency issues, giving flexibility to uh, customized reporting, common, common time frames, so all countries need to report every five years, uh, not legally binding yet, so it's an encouragement, there's no shall or should. In terms of response measures, which is a huge uh, in, in, uh, in the Arab world for economic diversification, uh, submission of um, inputs to the global stock take, uh, climate finance is also a, a major win, uh, doubling of climate finance for developing countries, and accessibility to the adaptation fund, eligibility for all developing countries, so including all Arab countries. So that's um, a brief on um, 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 COP26. And then the circular carbon economy as a way forward. So Saudi Arabia has proposed the CCE or the circular carbon economy as a framework and a new way to approach climate mitigation. It has proposed that in 2020 during the Riyadh G20 summit, and it was endorsed by all G20 countries. The idea is to focus on emissions rather than uh, energy sources. Um, of course, this is major for oil producing countries, but also um, other countries that rely on fossil fuels still. Uh, but the idea is to um, use, uh, keep all the options open, uh, options open when it comes to energy sources, but uh, really focus on managing the emissions. And there are four pathways or four R's to doing that. Reduce, reuse, recycle, and remove carbon emissions. And the idea here is to not look at CO2 as um, just a negative externality, but rather as an important feedstock for industries that are based on um, carbon, uh, uh, carbon based applications. So here are some examples under reduce, we have energy efficiency, non biomass renewables, nuclear power, fuel switching. Under reuse, we have synthetic fuels, fertilizers and urea, methanol and chemicals, polymers, concrete and under recycle, CO2 enhanced oil recovery, supercritical CO2 applications, and the concrete CO2 enhanced water recovery. And under remove, we have the natural sinks such as afforestation, soil and uh, oceans, bioenergy CCS, direct air capture and CO2 capture. There are many initiatives across the board uh, in the Arab region and GCC, especially in Saudi Arabia, which announced the Saudi Green Initiative and the Middle East Green Initiative of planting 40 billion trees across the region. So Saudi is planting its own trees, 10 billion trees within the kingdom, but also funding planting trees um, outside the, uh, uh, in the Middle East region and the Arab world, uh, up to 40 billion trees. So uh, with that, I'm gonna end here and I welcome your questions and happy to answer them. Thank you so much, Nura. I think that was really illuminating. I love all the data that you used, especially showcasing the variation across the Middle East and, the, and, and North Africa. I, I, and I, I feel like I speak for a lot of people who do work on the region. It's a struggle to find data that's up to date um, on the region. So I really appreciate you sharing that information with us. Um, and then last, but certainly not least, Shada, if you'd like to give your brief introduction. Thank you so much, Noor, for the kind intro and, of course, the MIT Arab Alumni Association for putting together this really great event. It's really nice to be virtually back in Cambridge. I uh, graduated back in May 2021, so it's nice to be back online. Can you guys hear me okay? Perfect. Um, so, I mean, I really appreciate what uh, Julia and Noura shared by way of illustrations and, you know, sort of giving us uh, an institutional perspective. Noura gave an excellent regional perspective. Um, so I'm going to share a few remarks from my experience uh, working at, with public, private, and international organizations uh, in Jordan and the region. And through my experience over the last 16 years, I've seen how the energy transition has been tackled at a national scale. Um, as Noura mentioned, you know, the Arab region, the countries in the region have very uh, economic, uh, economically diverse contexts. And so the energy transition story would be very different uh, based on their role as importers or exporters of energy. So for example, you know, over the last decade, I've seen a number of different drivers uh, where you know the energy sector is being developed, for example, in Jordan and countries of the region, which I'd like to share with you and summarize as follows. So the first driver I've seen 
is that the impetus uh, for achieving energy security is a key driver or achieving self-reliance. And we saw that in the case of Jordan, um, our energy strategy that came out uh, last year for the next decade, so 2020, 2030, um, you know, for a country like Jordan that imports 92% of its energy, uh, when we talk about uh, diversifying the energy mix, at the crux of that really is increasing self-reliance. Uh, you know, as we've seen with, with COVID-19, a country that is so dependent on external energy sources uh, was, is, is instantly affected by, uh, by shocks. So uh, that's a key impetus is really to, uh, whatever it is, you know, be it renewables, uh, be it, you know, in Jordan's case, they're also looking at nuclear, uh, looking at national energy sources. Uh, suffice to say, though, Jordan was one of the first countries in the region to uh, transition to renewables back in 2012. And uh, at the time, that was brought about by issuing a renewable energy law. And it achieved its target of getting to 10% renewables by 2020. Uh, and you know now it's raised its target to reach 14% by 2030. This is when we talk about the energy mix, uh, but when we talk about electricity generation, these numbers um, are almost double. So um, you know we've seen, as, as Nora shared, with Morocco, you know there are countries that have uh, really invested heavily in renewables and have super ambitious targets. And um, you know in, in, in Morocco's case, obviously, and Jordan's, uh, there is no lack of land, there is no lack of solar resources. Um, and so, you know, uh, when we talk about security, um, not only are we talking about energy security, but also water and food uh, in the context uh, of COVID. Um, and so that would be the first driver is really security of national resources. The second driver uh, would be sort of the international trends. Um, you know, maybe 10 years ago, or even uh, let's say five years ago with, with the Paris Agreement, uh, uh, sorry, six years ago, the driver at the time uh, maybe was somehow optional. Of course, the urgency of climate change, uh, you know, we have to remember we are talking about a global, potentially global catastrophe if we hit the 1.5 degree warming mark. So that to me now I think is the biggest driver for uh, a green energy or low carbon uh, future. And we need to remember that we already live in a world that's uh, reached one degree of increase. So we're really not talking about a future increase. We're already living it. And the impacts of climate change are manifesting uh, in many different ways all over the world. Uh, and you know, we've seen that in the IPCC reports that just came out. But we've also been seeing it just looking at the news every day. Uh, almost every single week, there is some kind of climate um, emergency or climate catastrophe. You know, the US just came out of, of, of a very difficult, um, you know, impacts uh, in, in the Midwest. Uh, just a few weeks ago, we saw cyclones in Oman. It just seems to be, um, you know, an ongoing cycle. So um, in terms of that second uh, driver, um, you know, the country, for example, a country like, like Jordan um, has, you know, 81% of its greenhouse gas emissions are linked to the energy sector. And so um, it is not surprising that, um, you know, even though Jordan is not, you know, one of the key energy exporting countries, it is actively engaged in the international climate policy dialogue. So in good faith, you know, a small country like Jordan uh, did raise its ambition uh, from greenhouse gas emissions from 14% by 2030 all the way to 31%, but noting that 26% of this is conditional on receiving international assistance. Uh, and so this is an opportunity for countries uh, that have, you know, uh, committed to hundreds of billions of dollars annually uh, to really uh, direct some of that financing to countries like Jordan in order to, for it to be able to actually meet uh, what's written in its NDCs, its nationally determined contributions. Um, and so at the same time, you know, even though this might seem like a daunting target, I, I see it as well as a development uh, opportunity for a country like Jordan uh, in a way the country is you know, still growing and it is still trying to strengthen its economy, its industry. So it is a great opportunity uh, to get on a green economic recovery pathway. And these are some of the topics that we explored in the green recovery plan that we re prepared for Jordan recently. So uh, the key idea there, even though, you know, climate change, um, you know, we all seem under this really large pressure to transition and transform, but it's also a development opportunity uh, for many countries, including a country like Jordan. Um, and of course, I just want to reiterate once again that uh, the water energy food nexus is super important, especially for a country like Jordan. Um, a large part of our energy bill goes to pumping water because of the um, 
our water resources are at a very much, you know, at a lower sort of um, level than where the consumption takes place. And so there's a lot of energy that goes into pumping and a lot of the water goes to agriculture. So any policy we take in energy is going to be um, automatically linked to what happens in water and what happens uh, to food. So we really mustn't forget that linkage and that story is uh, recurrent in other countries in the region. Um, and then the third driver I've seen for this transition uh, is the economic one, of course. And, um, you know, at one point in time, the kilowatt hour of solar energy, uh, you know, our region recorded the lowest price globally. At one point it was in Jordan, and then at one point it was in the United Arab Emirates. And so it just makes economic sense actually to install and operate uh, solar power projects. So that's one. Um, for, for, for Jordan as well, uh, energy is a key component of the operating cost, whether you're in, you know, in the industrial sector, in the private sector. So it's directly linked to your competitiveness uh, of you know, the prices of your national products and services. And so you know, I work a lot in economic reform. Jordan is definitely up there in terms of, um, you know, I use a term that Professor Hausman at Harvard uses, it is a binding constraint for economic growth. If we do not tackle uh, the cost of energy for a country like Jordan, uh, then you know, this has huge impacts on, on the economy and its ability to grow and just compete. And so there is the economic driver as well. Um, of course, there's also the uh, impetus to attract investment. Uh, the solar energy projects in Jordan that I mentioned have already attracted billions of dollars in investment to the country. And so there's a desire to replicate that experience um, and you know, attract foreign direct investments. And uh, of course, job creation is, is, I would say, the top economic challenge for a country like Jordan. And you know, unemployment today is at one of its highest levels uh, in, in a long time specifically brought about by COVID-19. And so the idea is, you know, investments come in, but also they create jobs, um, you know, through these kinds of clean energy projects. So in closing, uh, you know, after we've kind of, I've shared with you from my experience, those three drivers, I think the enablers for this transition moving forward is, as I said, the growing commitment to this sort of net zero world that Julie showed us, like all these worlds are aligned right now. Uh, the regional initiatives we have, like uh, Sarah Noura mentioned on the Saudi green Middle East, but also, you know, the EU is talking about a green deal, the US is talking about a green deal. Those are key partners for collaboration with the Arab region. Uh, you know, countries like Jordan on the national level, we've got a national green growth plan, a green recovery plan, ambitious climate policies. So I think those are going to continue to get stronger. Uh, technological advancements are happening. We need to see more affordable storage technology to really uh, help with the uptake of renewables. Uh, I think innovation is going to play a key role because the technology that works in the US doesn't necessarily translate to a context in Jordan. And so really supporting local innovation, uh, you know, opening up opportunities for green jobs and entrepreneurs, um, you know, I'm part of a green entrepreneurship network and I see a lot of activity in this area in Jordan and the region. Uh, and of course, as I said, uh, the role of the private sector, you know, for them to put their money in these in, in amazing projects all over the world, not just, you know, in the typical markets where they usually invest. And of course, international climate finance, uh, COP26 came out with big financial commitments. We want to see them translated to projects on the ground. And finally, last but not least, I think regional cooperation is going to be an important uh, enabler moving forward because every country in the region has success stories to share with other countries. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sada. And, and I completely agree with what you're saying. I think I see so much innovation when it comes to energy, when it comes to climate tech, and a lot of that technology is ready to be piloted or sometimes even scaled. And so how can the Arab region, one that is considered to be energy poor in some places, but very energy rich in others, how can we attract that sort of innovation and piloting and testing and make it seem um, really attractive for entrepreneurs as well as investments? So totally agree. Um, and so Julie, I would love to go back to, you know, you briefly described your skills of sustainability and I know you teach a class on that. So why is it really important to think about sustainability just in terms of various scales? Mm, that's a great question. So again, this is something I continue to explore, but having been a pioneer in this field, I often had to spend a lot of time justifying, well, why higher education? We're only a piece of the pie, you know, this is too small. But the more I understood organizations, the more I realized so many of the challenges that we're all discussing today had to be solved at the local level. We're making, we're making decisions daily as individuals and as organizations as to how, how we 
you know, produce energy. In this case, we can ask that question at a place like MIT, how we purchase energy, how we buy energy, how we use energy as individuals in our offices, our labs, and cut that across everything I work on, transportation, food, materials. And so then we have to look at, well, where are the leverage points in context to that? You know, so where are the opportunities with respect to energy at the grid level? You know, how do we consider what's happening at the grid to then back to what uh, Shada was saying, you know, thinking similarly, I was picturing myself in an institute in your own country of that we can actually ask the exact same questions by thinking at scale. We can find out what's happening at the grid, what are our renewable energy portfolios in Massachusetts and the states, you know, or in your case, right, Jordan. Um, and so thinking about understanding that context to then influence what's going to happen at the local level. So we need to be thinking about, um, for example, you know, heating and cooling. How are we going to, where there's a lot of discussion, for example, around electrification. If we know that Massachusetts and the ISO New England grid are going to accelerate the use of uh, everything from, you know, renewables, offshore wind, there's, I think, some questions around nuclear, where that's going to stand, then what do we need to do to prepare for that to get to zero emissions at the, at the campus level? Um, so back to the justification, just to wrap up, I have to think about how can we be a model for other organizations? How can our own faculty think about scaling solutions? Um, and then equally, what's, going, what's happening globally that we now need to scale down? And what's interesting just today is we're all thinking very similarly. None, none of us have ever met. You know, we haven't worked together, but coming from very different places, we, we all have very similar, despite place, we're all trying to, we have a, a common target of, of at the moment net zero by 2050 until it has to be accelerated even faster, right? And trying to figure out how to, how to solve at the, at the uh, grid level and at the organizational level. So uh, I'm finding it quite transformative and game-changing to ask those questions. And then you can find a place for almost every faculty I member I work with. You can find a place for people who are thinking about organizational systems and people to people who are designing fusion, right? At the for the whole system. So that's my, my brief response. There's always more to go from there, but thank you for bringing that up and recognizing that important opportunity, both at MIT, but in all of our uh, locations. Thanks so much, Julie. And, you know, going back to Nuda and Shada, you know, your jobs are very much more on a national and regional scale. So how much of the scales of sustainability is used in your work, or is there a more another dominant theory of thinking. Um, and, and feel free, whoever would like to go first. Yeah, sure, I can, um, I can take that. I'm not very familiar with the scales of sustainability that you're referring to, but sustainability uh, guides our thinking and guides the, uh, the plans here. So there's the uh, UN SDGs, you have UN SDG 7 and UN SDG 13, and they're all equally important. So the struggle is usually um, making sure people have access to reliable energy, affordable energy, but at the same time, of course, ensuring climate action. So I would say that sustainability is seen in, in balancing these two, uh, balancing the equation. And of course, sustainability uh, sits on the three pillars, economic diversification, environmental sustainability, and social prosperity. So it's a very delicate balance, uh, especially for developing countries, I would say, and in reference to the Arab world with all the challenges that uh, we talked about, including the water challenges, development challenges, stability and security challenges. So it's, it's much more than just, you know, having a net zero target. It's how to um, really um, uh, treat carefully and uh, develop plans that are very balanced, that would ensure no disruption. Uh, I mean, we all heard about the protests around the world when uh, introducing taxes on fossil fuels, for instance, uh, the yellow vests in France, for instance, the COP25 that was moved from Chile to, uh, you know, ironically, the UN Climate Change Conference, which was moved from Chile to Spain because of these protests that uh, made the country no longer uh, secure enough and stable enough to uh, host the COP25. So uh, these are real issues, you know, employment is a real issue, economic diversification, safety, uh, uh, security, uh, political stability. 
Um, so we are, we should be very careful when we talk about energy transition. It can't be abrupt. It can't be, the pace has to be, uh, you know, in line with the development plans, the social development and so on. Uh, and I'll, I'll leave it at that. And uh, we may pick up, uh, you know, the topic again and, and discuss further. Shada, would, would you like to add uh, anything to the scales of sustainability thinking or what Nura mentioned? Yeah, I, I think I got cut off a little bit when you were saying your question, Nur, uh, but I think you were asking how we use that in our work in Jordan, something to that effect. Okay. Um, but I wanted to maybe say a little bit that, you know, before we talk about scales of sustainability, I just want to point out that the concept of sustainability is not yet fully mainstreamed uh, at the national level. So it's important to say that, you know, this is a, a work in progress, uh, you know, the Ministry of Planning, where I've supported, they lead uh, the planning and monitoring of, you know, progress on SDGs, because that's kind of the you know, kind of global framework for, for sustainability nowadays. Uh, but, you know, that won't really, you know, translate into anything tangible or successful unless it's reflected in the policies and strategies of key uh, line agencies. And in order for that to happen, you know, we're constantly trying to make the economic case, uh, you know, that going uh, towards, for example, energy storage or green hydrogen actually means jobs or going towards low carbon uh, transport uh, also means, you know, better air quality and it means a lower health bill for the country, uh, you know, so looking at these things in a more holistic way. Um, and so that's why, you know, uh, when we work on, on the economic reform agenda, for example, over the past year, what I've been trying to do is really link the uh, climate change agenda to our economic reform agenda. So, uh, for example, now we're talking about, uh, you know, our national budget when it's being prepared. How are we tagging projects to be climate responsive? You know, our national procurement system, um, you know, how can we integrate uh, green procurement? Uh, because these are investments that the government's making today for the next uh, 20 years. Um, so, you know, I think it's very important to bridge between technical uh, line agencies like the Ministries of Environment. They do a lot of the technical work, but that won't really translate into anything tangible unless you've got your planning and budgeting people. I think similarly, I'm sure Julie, you know, they have amazing plans, but unless they can get the budgeting and the financing to implement them, uh, you know, students and people won't feel it on the ground. And so I see that same parallel at the national level. Uh, level, but you know, you asked me also about scales. So national is not enough in a country like Jordan or anywhere really. Uh, there have to be as well local policies, and this as well goes with Jordan's move towards decentralization. The country is made up of twelve governorates, and we're trying uh, to really empower decision making, financing at that govern governorate level. Uh, and so we've seen very interesting things come up, like uh, CCAPs or sustainable energy and climate action plans that are developed at that municipal level. Um, and so, you know, this is really an important way to engage like the private sector on that local level, uh, community based organizations, youth, universities, NGOs, because sometimes those institutions really get bogged down and overwhelmed when you try and engage them on national issues. But when you bring them in at the local scale, they really feel that they can have a role and get involved. Um, and so, um, you know, institutionally, of course, uh, you know, when we talk about the private sector, there are a lot of opportunities that the government is trying to put in front of the private sector, be it, you know, we've got a public private partnership law or the PPP law, uh, you know, incentives for clean technology in Jordan, they're tax exempt, customs exempt, um, or, and of course, doing the homework, you know, every country uh, that's engaged in the Paris Agreement process has a list of you know, climate projects or green projects. And so that pipeline is really valuable to have uh, because it's an investment opportunity. You're telling the private sector, you know, hey, I'm ready for you to play a role in kind of my national uh, uh, challenge or national opportunity, uh, if you will. Thank you. Um, wonderful. And I love that linkage between eco economy and then like sustainability because Studies have shown this is going to be a $50 trillion industry, right? The, the move towards sustainability, towards energy transition, it's not just um, something that's idealistic and, and good for your health, good for the environment, but there's money to be made here. And I think that's something that we need to continually mention and say, especially for people who work in a region that have lived their whole life supported by the oil and gas legacy, right? Um, 
And so with that, I'll have one more qu prepared questions. And I know there have been a number of questions that have been rolling in from our audience, which is wonderful. And if we don't get to your question today, we'll compile them, share them with our panelists. And then hopefully when we get an executive summary in two weeks after uh, this webinar, they will be answered um, and we'll follow up with that. But one last question, I do wanna to touch on something that Nura mentioned because I think it's really important. Um, what is the biggest obstacle you really see to a just energy transition for the Arab world? And I specifically want to think about, you know, people whose livelihood will continue to rely on coal, oil, and gas. And how do we transition without the least amount of harm to them? Especially when we think of a context of developing countries, of which you mentioned all the Arab world is, right? The developed countries have gone through their industrial revolution we're able to make use of all these, you know, polluting industries to their economic advantage. And now, you know, we are lagging behind, but we still want to, you know, push forward economically. So when we think about that, what are your thoughts? And, and really this question is open to any of our panelists. Nura, maybe uh, you'd like to go first. Sure, yes, thank you, Noor, for this very important question. And it's a real question as we become, um, as we see, you know, more, um strict outcomes from cop uh, like you know the beginning of mentioning um phasing uh, down fossil fuels next will be phasing out fossil fuels and oil and gas and so on uh, when a lot of uh, our arab countries are uh, and developing countries are reliant on um fossil fuels um and um uh, and still need to develop economically um i think that providing finance and providing technology is important um, and needs to be uh, incorporated uh, and activated um you know uh, we heard about the 100 billion dollar um uh, fund for for climate which has never really materialized and we've heard doubling that in cop 26 and i hope we really materialize that because without financial uh, without financial uh, assistance without providing um technology and, and capacity building the developing world is really um they, it cannot really uh, they cannot uh, achieve any climate action or climate targets because you have priorities and there are national uh, contexts there are national priorities uh, for every country um, i mean climate is one of them but the, the equation as i mentioned is is greater than that you have uh, uh, challenges that uh, really uh, affect uh, the society the economy and so on so in brief it's providing really uh, finance as well as technology uh, capacity building for developing countries Wonderful. Um, maybe then we can start to move to some of the questions that our audience have asked. And I, I want to go to a question asked by Sarah Simon. Uh, what kind of CO2 tracking systems and reporting dates maybe annually are in place in the Arab nations? And how would interested people get access to that data? And I think Shada, uh, you have marked that you might be able to answer that. Yes, thank you so much for that question. That is such an important point uh, because, you know, as we talk about climate commitments, countries need to find a transparent way to track and communicate that they're achieving their commitments. So, for example, in Jordan, the system in place is called the Monitoring, Reporting and Verification System, the MRV. And, you know, this is an ID system that was developed actually locally in Jordan. So, hence, you know, here we're talking about actually creating jobs. You know, people here nationally develop that system. And now the system is being deployed in the key sort of sectors uh, to capture, you know, CO2 reduction by different projects. Um, so we'll get to a point where we're able to, you know, in our next communication to the, to the United Nations Framework Convention or the UNFCCC, we're able to say, you know, we achieved X percent of our target reduction. That adds credibility to the country that allows it to attract financing. Um, and so this kind of system is actually something that Jordan, for example, can share with uh, their experience with other countries. This is exactly the kind of knowledge transfer and sharing that I was referring to that countries of the region can do with each other. So thank you for your question. Nura? I see you have your hand up. Would you like to follow? Thank you. Great answer by Shada. But if I may add um, some perspective from, um, you know, the COP and, and, and the negotiations on transparency itself as uh, one of the uh, outcomes uh, in COP. But the issues were um, how frequent the, the reporting is done. So the issue was five years or, or, or 10 years because the, um, the transparency issue is really about uh, capacity and finance. 
because the, the tables that are required for reporting is uh, very much details and requires um, uh, capacity, high, higher capacity. So we have uh, uh, detailed tables that may cost um, an average of a million dollars. So we're talking about developing countries that uh, don't have the capacity to report as often. Um, and so uh, the outcome that we saw was an encouragement for countries to report every five years. And it's still not a binding, um, the word was not, the word used was encouraged rather than shall or should. So it's not um, a binding, but I understand the limitations uh, that, uh, especially on cost uh, that developing countries have. So uh, having an annual reporting is really uh, gonna be very costly for developing countries if finance and, uh, you know, capacity building is not provided uh, through uh, the adaptation fund or through the climate uh, finance. Thank you so much, Nura, for adding to that point. Um, Julie, we had a couple of questions just generally saying, you know, great, MIT is doing a lot, but oftentimes people might think it's not doing enough. So what are your thoughts? Um, it's, I mean, it's so nuanced and it's so complex, right? Even at an institutional level. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. People are always going to think that, um, I mean, this is all hands-on right now, everyone. I mean, I have this faculty group. Um, we're very transparent in terms of how we're trying to figure this out. Um, I think people would be surprised to know that even energy, you know, you'd think that we would have gone down in energy use with COVID, but we still had to heat and cool and provide electricity to buildings. Like look, um, you know, throughout COVID, we were still housing people, research was still taking place. And so this is a, it's a challenge. Um, we need to keep the Institute moving. You can't just turn, you know, turn the Institute off, if you will. So um, we're open to suggestions. Um, we are trying to navigate how to do this, as I shared with you, all of those pieces, all of those uh, examples I provided in terms of how we're seeking zero emissions are all activated and being invested in right now. I think what's at the heart of this is how do you replace the power plant? Is that what has to happen? So at the heart of the Institute, as you may all recall, we have our central utility plant and we're in our, what I call our fourth energy era. And MIT was built on coal, can all of you, in the audience recall the, you know, the train track, right? I mean, I just learned this when I moved here, you know, eight years ago, you know, the train track brought coal, it, the whole power plant, MIT was built around coal. It then shifted to uh, oil and natural gas in um, not until, uh, I have to go back to the time, but I wanna say uh, early nineties, maybe, um, it must've been before that. Uh, so I, I have to go back to, I apologize. But anyway, the error is being coal, then to oil and natural gas, and then predominantly to, to from, from predominantly oil to natural gas and oil, and now only natural gas. And so we're now in the natural gas only, you know, efficient natural gas phase. We're producing all of our own electricity, steam, and chilled water. It's all at a carbon um, the, the carbon intensity is less than the grid, and we're measuring that on a daily basis. There's a whole system in place now. The projections, uh, some of this came out of the class that I taught to, in terms of how to institutionalize that. So the projections are, will be, um, we'll have a lower in carbon intensity than the grid until for the next 15 to 25 years, depending upon the acceleration of the renewable energy portfolio or the future of nuclear for that matter. So that is the bridge we're in. And so we can receive as much criticism that's, you know, naturally people want us to do more, but until we figure that out, we're gonna to continue to shift to a new energy error, um, you know, be in touch with what's happening at the city, state and national level for opportunities for investment and really figure out how does, you know, do we electrify the whole campus and just plug into the grid? We are capable of doing that. Um, so that is you know, a bit of a convoluted response because all, it's, all of these ideas are being activated right now. And back to my scales, keep in mind that we're trying to figure out what has to take, what are the institutional leverages in terms of better design, increased efficiency, new ways of doing research, and what are the individual leverages where people have to remember to 
you know, turn off their lights, bring sweaters like myself to campus. You know, what are those individual behaviors that are going to have to be uh, adjusted to? So um, I hear you, uh, and we've got a full, uh, you know, we've got really the campus engaged on this. So stay tuned, and uh, keep let's keep in touch on how we're how we're going to get there. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, and so we are right on the dot. And I, I want to say thank you to all three of our panelists. This is wonderful. I feel like we barely scratched the surface. There's so much to talk about. But I really think the important thing is having these conversations, understanding that the energy transition is here. And I heard a lot about investment. I heard a lot about regional cooperation. I heard a lot about transparency and reporting. I mean, all these things are really important, just thinking about it, that at the local scale, national scale, and then regional or international scale is so, so, so incredibly important. Thank you so much to our attendees. Um, we have a list of your questions. I'll share them with the panelists afterwards. But I, I think this was wonderful. Thank you um, so much, Shada, Nura, and Julie. This was great. Um, and we we are recording this webinar. It'll be up on YouTube. So if you follow MIT Arab Alumni Association, you can find us on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and Facebook. Uh, you'll be able to catch that up. So thank you all once again. And uh, we'll see you soon with another webinar. Thank you, Noor. Thank you. I have to run, but thank you. Nice meeting you. Thanks. Yeah, wonderful to meet you, Shada. Absolutely. Let's uh, be in touch via a new hour, too. I'm really interested in, uh, I think there's real interesting opportunity to kind of watch what's happening in each of these regions. Be a really interesting alumni program, by the way, Moana mm -hmm. would be, you know, to almost map where MIT alum are with respect to, um, you know, net zero goals. It's fascinating, isn't it? Um, I totally agree. And yeah. um, I especially maybe Shada, I can touch base with you after um, with Green Town Labs. I think we do a lot of innovation around oh, climate yeah. tech um, yeah. and just looking at a lot of our entrepreneurs need places like the Middle East where it's sunny and hot and they yeah. can scale their technology. Um, exactly. So maybe making some of those connections. That would be so great. Exciting. Yeah. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank All you. Right. Take care, everybody. Thank Bye. you. Bye. -bye.